what is helpful about all these forms of revelation is, you know, sometimes the hardest part is just admitting to yourself this thing happened. But what's even more helpful than just, you know, releasing your secret into the ether is observing how another person responds to it. And that's why a conversation with another person is often much better. Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Unlikely Collaborators. Their mission is to untangle the stories that hold us back as individuals, communities, nations, and humanity at large. Using the Perception Box lens, they do this through storytelling, experiences, impact, investments, and scientific research. Unlikely Collaborators, the only way forward is inward. Later on in this episode, I'll talk a lot more about the Perception Box and how it relates to this episode. But right now, let me tell you about today's guest. Today, we welcome Michael Sleppy into the show. Michael is the Sanford C. Bernstein & Co. Associate Professor of Leadership and Ethics at Columbia University. A recipient of the Rising Star Award from the Association for Psychological Science, he is the leading expert on the psychology of secrets. He's authored more than 50 articles on secrecy, truth, and deception. Michael's research has been covered by the New York Times, The Atlantic, NPR, BBC, The Wall Street Journal, and more. He is the author of The Secret Life of Secrets. In this episode, I talk to Michael Slepian about the psychology of secrets. Everyone has secrets that they keep from others, but how does this affect our relationships and well-being? According to Michael, maintaining privacy is not the most burdensome aspect. Carrying a secret all by ourselves is what weighs us down. Michael and I explore the different categories of secrets, and we talk about when to reveal the deepest parts of ourselves and who to reveal them to. We also touch on the topics of personality, morality, trauma, developmental psychology, and communication. This was a really fun and enlightening chat on a topic that is not really talked about that much, and there's really not a lot in the psychological literature about this. So I really appreciate Michael for studying this topic and for teaching us all about the hidden world of secrets. So without further ado, I bring you Michael Slepian. Well, I really enjoyed your new book, uh, The Secret of Secrets, How Our Inner Worlds Shape Well-Being, Relationships, and Who We Are. I learned a lot about secrets in this book, uh, did, like a lot of nuances that I didn't even know existed. Would you start off by telling uh, our audience a little bit about your family's bombshell secret? And uh, is that what got you started in, in really wanting to study this topic? So uh, in 2013, I had been studying secrecy for about a year. So it was brand new research mm. at the time. And I was, in fact, on interview at Columbia for the position that I have now. And on that day, I'm spending the whole day showcasing this new research on secrecy. And at the end of that night, when I'm actually still out with folks, I get a call from my dad, a missed call, and I get a second missed call, and I'm starting to get worried something really tragic has happened. And mm -hmm. what turns out to be the case is that my dad on the phone says, hi, I have to tell you something. I'm not biologically able to have children. He was telling me that he wasn't my biological father and that that this was a secret that they had planned to keep from me forever. <laughs> and um, wow. of course, that's that's really surprising information. But I really quickly accepted that new reality, that idea that, well, you know, whether or not I'm genetically related to my dad, it doesn't make a difference. He's still my dad. My really good friends I'm not genetically related to that's fine. <laughs> uh, and so mm -hmm. I I kind of accepted it really quickly, the, the reality as shocking as it was, but it was the secret keeping that was even more surprising that why was the secret kept from me? And, you know, who else knew it turned out my entire family apart from me and my younger brother had known the whole time. Wow. That's, that's, um, yeah, I, that, I imagine that really affected you. Did you ever meet your, the, who your uh, genetic father is? No. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, you know, that's something that I, I'm not interested in, um, at least not at this moment, but yeah. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so you started studying this topic. Well, you, you had been studying at that time and then you, uh, you've been studying it for the past 10 years. So, you know, what are, what are, what would you say is like one of the most surprising findings you found about secrets that you really wouldn't have been able to predict going into it? Yeah, and that's pretty much where this research started. So my very early studies in secrecy were suggesting that part of the burden of a secret is just simply thinking about a secret. And so in my earliest studies, I had people think about a secret and looked at whether they felt a sense of burden in that moment. 
And when I started presenting that research to people, some people were like, wait a minute, how is this secrecy? You're just having someone think about a secret. That's not secrecy. You have to have someone to hide a secret to study secrecy. You have to have someone in a conversation hiding from the other person in the room. And what turns out to be what was surprising at first is that actually is a very marginal form of secrecy is, and it's pretty rare that we have to conceal our secrets. And when we do, we're really prepared for those moments for the most part and concealing secrets turns out to be the easy part. Um, the surprising thing is that it's all the other moments when our secrets hurt us the most. That was certainly surprising at, at, in the beginning. And so it's something I've been exploring for, for years now. I really want to, to further discuss throughout this today, you know, what the, the deep practical implications of that are. But let's start off with like, I should have, I should have started off with the first question is what is a secret? You know, because you, you look at it as something you look at it as an intention. Is that right? Yeah. So I define secrecy as the intention to withhold information back from one or more people. And so there's plenty of things that other people don't know about us. Um, not all of those things are secrets. If the reason other people don't know about this thing about you because you're intentionally withholding it, then that would be a secret. And you could still talk about it with other people, but as long as you're intending to keep it from one person, I would call it a secret. What is it about um, the way humans are wired where, I guess my question is how do secrets evolve? You know, Is it like uh, something that uh, plays off some uh, genetically evolved personality traits. Like, where is it? Where did it come from? When once we got the language, you know, who was the first one who told the secret? And then other humans were like, "Oh, that's fun." <laughs> so it turns out you can actually see some evidence that chimpanzees can conceal oh. objects and, and actions from other chimpanzees, and so we're not the only ones who can keep secrets. You're right. Language, just, language changes things, uh, of course, too. But essentially, our ability to keep secrets is. Uh, an outcome of being able to really competently think about other minds as well as our own and to recognize that something in our head is not necessarily in others' heads. And once you have a good understanding of that, you can start competently keeping secrets. And so children will develop this skill um, throughout early childhood. Yeah, that's um, very Piaget, right? Uh, um, to being able to have some perspective taking of some sort seems to be required to be able be able to tell a secret because you can't I guess you can't tell a secret to yourself <laughs> like you can't uh, keep a secret I, I should say you can't keep a secret from yourself can you that's actually really an interesting question <laughs> yeah someone posed that question once to me not long ago and I was like well let me think about that and then they came up with a bunch of great examples people who are having a child who don't want to know the sex of that child can keep that secret from themselves by not getting the information, things like that. Um, things where you can, you could access the information if you chose to, but you've chosen not to. That's true. Yeah. Well, that's why I wanted to think about it a little bit more. I was like, wait a minute, actually, maybe I shouldn't be so quick to say it's not possible. Um, I guess it's different than I was trying to think in my head. Is that different than deceiving yourself? You know, like um, and it is, I guess it is. Yeah, yeah. I think where deception is distinct from secrecy is there's plenty of ways to keep a secret that don't involve lying. Um, lying, sure. of course, is a way to keep a secret too. Um, I would suggest a risky way. Yeah. Um, you So you distinguish between secrecy and privacy. Uh, what is the difference between the two? So privacy is a general reflection of how much comfort you need or how close someone needs to be to you for you to reveal something sensitive. So someone who's really private needs someone to be really close to talk about more intimate details. Um, but that's still different from specifically intending to withhold information from other people. So some examples of things that might be private that might seem like secret um, issues around money. Um, we tend not to talk mm. about out of concern of politeness. Um, that's if that's why you don't talk about it, that might be privacy rather than the specific intent to withhold something, some financial decision back from other people. Sex is another example of something we tend not to talk about with others unless we're close with them. Uh, but again, mm -hmm. that's different from specifically wanting some specific sexual experience to, to not be known by others. Mm. Um, how many secrets does the average person hold at one time? And how would one even figure something like that out? So I can give you a partial answer to that question where uh, one way to get there is to first understand what are the common secrets people keep? And we asked a couple thousand people, what's the secret you're currently keeping right now? And from those responses created this list of 38 categories of common secrets. And this list actually is really comprehensive uh, because if someone no. just says, 
What is the secret they're keeping? 92% of the time it fits one of the items on the list. 97% of people have at least one of the secrets from that list. And the average person at any given moment is keeping 13 secrets from that list of 38. Oh, humans. You know, in some ways that number is an underestimate because that's looking at how many different kinds of secrets people have. And so they have 13 different kinds of secrets on average. You might have multiple secrets of the same category. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I read that research wrong because I just said the average number is 13, but that's 13 kinds. That's incredible. Wow. Can you, can you give me, um, some of your favorite categories. I mean, like I want, I would love for you to like run down the list of all of them, but we don't have time for that, I guess. But can you, can you what are some of the, what are some of the, the most just salacious <laughs> for our listeners? Most salacious. Well, this, this isn't very salacious, but I find it quite interesting. And it's actually a really common secret. The secret that people have that they least commonly talk about is what we call extra relational thoughts. You're in a relationship with one person and having some kind of romantic thoughts about another person. Um, This is a common experience. This is something we commonly don't talk about. Other common secrets include lies we've told, secret ambitions, family secrets is a big one, violations of others' trust, of course, infidelity and cheating and so on. Yeah, yeah. So... I, I'm a personality researcher, uh, psychologist. So this is uh, my, my, I have lots of like questions relating to individual differences. Um, what have you found in your research? Is the intersection of personality traits and secret keeping? Have you looked at the Big Five, that sort of thing? And so the Big Five so show some interesting and reliable relationships with how many secrets people keep. And so some are very intuitive. For example, introverted people have more secrets. Extroverted people have fewer secrets. Another one that's more intuitive is that um, emotionally stable people have fewer secrets, more neurotic people have more secrets. Um, The one I find very interesting is conscientiousness. The conscientious Mm. have more secrets. That sort of carefulness and diligence even goes as far as holding information. That's really interesting. Yeah. Oh, wait, what, did you go through all the five? What about, I guess, openness? Did you say openness? Um, openness and agreeableness don't associate with the number of secrets people keep. Yeah. Really? So a complication is that they these traits are, though, reliably, reliably related to having experiences that people commonly keep secret. So, for example, open people are more likely to have these experiences that kind of push the boundaries, but they're not more likely to keep them secret. And then agreeable people, less agreeable people are also more likely to find themselves in these sort of complicated situations, but it's not related to keeping them more secret. Um, That's for example, really extroversion is related to getting these situations more, but keeping fewer of them secret. Can you say that one more time? Extroverted like people yeah. do find themselves more in these situations that people commonly oh. keep secret, but they keep fewer of okay. them secret. They keep fewer of them secret. Wow. That is, that is so cool. How does secret relate to gossip, uh, the gossip drive? I read some really interesting papers on the evolution of gossip and the functions that it serves. Do they both serve similar functions? So they're, they they do map onto some of the motivations we see in terms of keeping secrets and sharing secrets. And so one reason to gossip is just that it's interesting. Um, it's a way to learn things and it's a way to bond over sort of juicy information. Another reason to gossip is you want to harm the reputation of someone who's a bad actor. And so this is comes to be careful who you should reveal, who you reveal your secrets to. If you reveal a secret to someone who's totally scandalized by what you're telling them, who finds what you're telling them to be morally objectionable, um, they're more likely to tell a third party that secret as a form of punishment. And so one reason to gossip that's sort of related to what we're talking about is you want to sort of punish immoral behavior mm. of others. This is not this is not necessarily positive psychology, is it? <laughs> uh, but also, I, I don't want to send the wrong message. Most of the time, confiding yeah. leads to good outcomes for you and the person you're confiding to, and that often strengthens the relationship. So there's a lot of good. It's mostly good that comes from confiding oh, our secrets. You just want to choose your person carefully. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and that so that is that can be placed. Whew, you saved it. No, that can be that can be placed within the positive psychology uh, high quality relationships framework. High quality. H, uh, that, but that's also big in the business world, right? Uh, Jane Dudden's work on high quality relationships, right? And trust is, is such a big one for a high quality relationship. So yeah, maybe like, yes, telling secrets can really increase your 
sense of trust. And, and also, I, uh, uh, Abraham Maslow, uh, who I um, talk a lot about um, in his writings, he, he had uh, written about self-actualizing, lo- self-actualized lovers tell lots of secrets to each other. That it really, uh, he mentioned that in, in one of his books in like the 60s. That always, that always stuck with me. Yeah. There's something sexy about, about two lovers telling a secret to each other. Yeah, I mean, I think when you when you reveal a secret to someone who's in a very long committed relationship, I think some people expect that that will then be passed on to the partner unless you specifically say otherwise. Yeah, exactly. Today's podcast is sponsored by Unlikely Collaborators. Their mission is to untangle the stories that hold us back as individuals, communities, nations and humanity at large. Using the Perception Box lens, they do this through storytelling, experiences, impact, investments, and scientific research. Today's conversation with Michael really illustrates the importance of expanding the walls of our Perception Box. The Perception Box is the invisible mental box that we all live inside, and it can seriously hinder our ability to understand one another and to understand ourselves. In this episode, Michael goes deep into the psychology of secrets and shows the impact holding various forms of secrets can have on our lives and the lives of others. From a perception box perspective, the shame that can come from holding a secret can cause the biggest contraction of our perception box. If you're holding a secret, you're essentially telling yourself the story that you believe others are going to judge you for the things you intentionally are withholding from people. Maybe you feel like a bad person because of the secret. However, virtually every time I told a loved one a secret that I thought I would have to feel shame over, I actually received sympathy and even often a me too. These moments are so connecting and authentic, and my perception box usually feels more expanded than ever. To find out more about Unlikely Collaborators and the perception box, go to unlikelycollaborators.com. Let's unpack a little more about where it develops in childhood and um, especially in, you know, adolescence, teenage years, maybe there's a peak. Is there like a, do you have a chart of when people tell more, more secrets than not throughout the lifespan? Can you kind of, and I'm asking a lot of questions at once, just unpack it all. <laughs> <laughs> so certainly by age three, children will try to keep secrets, um, not very effectively. They'll do things like saying they didn't eat any cookies, except having cookie crumbs on their lips and, and things like that. Um, but as they get a little bit older, they start understanding They have a much better understanding of the things that are in their head that are not necessarily in others' heads and a better understanding of how to keep those things secret. So, for example, in their earlier years, they might blame a ghost for for breaking a vase, whereas in their later years, they might blame the cat. Um, So they they start getting better at keeping secrets. And for the most part, children keeping secrets is not really a problem. You know, maybe they're getting into less trouble. So there's, you know, we're talking about less serious issues in the beginning where where secrecy starts becoming harmful is adolescence. And there's the sort of healthy form of privacy that teens will develop and seek. And parents should allow their teenagers to develop that sphere of privacy. That's not a problem. But when teenagers start keeping things like worries and struggles and shames secret that's when Mm. the problems can begin when they're sort of too worried about saying the wrong thing instead of getting the help that they need that's when we see secrecy hurting teenagers and it's the same way secrets hurt adults well that makes a lot of sense well what can we do to what can we do to combat that in in adolescence how can we increase and put that somewhere in our education you want to somehow send the message that it's okay to hold things private but if there's if somebody's being harmed, whether it's another person or you, that's not the kind of thing you should keep entirely to yourself. That's something you really should talk to someone else about. So sort of helping them understand what's a healthy way of having privacy and, and when is it time to come to someone with a secret. Well, we have a lot of time here today, so I wanted to um, uh, read uh, the whole list of all the secret categories. They're not The categories are not secret, but these are categories of secretness. You, you know what I'm saying. People know what I'm saying. Extra relational thoughts is uh, the highest prevalence. Um, and this is an order of, of, of the percentage of people with this experience uh, from uh, most populous <laughs> to least populous. Extra relational thoughts, sexual behavior, emotional infidelity, personal story. Now, okay, what's personal story? Uh, that's kind of like a catch-all category. Do you have some specific story that you keep secret that didn't fit one of the other categories? Gotcha. Thank you. Counter-normative. Okay, okay what's that? 
um, something that you feel is counter to norms, you know, whether that's picking your nose or, or something um, more s significant that you find to be unusual. You know, for some people, that's like they it's an adult who really likes watching kids shows or, or whatever. Gotcha. Theft. Wow, that, that theft is high up there. Oh, humans. theft. So it's oh, important. Humans. This is theft in the most broadly construed way. Um, so, for example, one time when I was staying over at a friend's and I realized I needed socks and I didn't have any socks, I took my friend's socks and I, you know, I didn't ask first. Um, and I, I don't know if I gave them back either. Um, any kind of taking without asking, it doesn't have to be like serious theft. Gotcha. Um, then sexual infidelity. Um, ambition. I'm very, that's a that's a very interesting one. People hiding their ambition. My research has found that those who score high in uh, what's called vulnerable narcissism hide have very high, they have very high ambitions, but they they're very uh, they're more likely to hide it from others and feel shame over having high ambitions. So I, I imagine that it, you you'd probably find a correlation between the emotion of shame and and that one. Yeah, that's I think I that. Say. I think also embarrassment is part of that story where people have some kind of ambition and they're, they know there's a chance they don't achieve it. And rather than people find out that they didn't achieve the goal, you know, better to just not tell anyone. And then especially for the really ambitious things, it's like, you know, they might not even get close. And so they better rather keep it secret. Yeah. Self-harm, uh, work, school, cheating, romantic desire, um, lie, violate trust. Family secret, um, no sex. Now, what do you, what's no? People are secret about no sex. What does that mean? Yeah, yeah. I, I think um, this, this is also a very interesting one because, of course, there's you know sexual experiences that you'll see on that list that people keep secret. But another secret that they yeah. keep is when they are currently not having sex. Dry um, spell, dry spell time. <laughs> yeah. I, I think uh -huh. I, I, there's someone else's research that I, I can't remember their their name right now, but essentially people think other people are having more sex than they, than they are. Um, and so if you feel like you're not having it, that might be something you don't want to admit to. So interesting. Uh, it's just like if everyone was just honest with each other, wouldn't we realize how much more similar we are to each other than different? I think the people who are out there having like uh, millions of sexual partners, I think those are the outliers. I think that's what the research shows. Um, but anyway, we can move on for that. Other women, men. Okay, so yeah, so is that someone's, not necessarily infidelity? Someone's that, cheating. It, it, someone's cheating, cheating on their cheating. partner to be with you. Okay. Finances. Um, oh, I'm so rich. Is that it? Like, oh, uh, look how much I make. Uh, anything. Oh, no, you know, anything, anything relating to finances. Yeah. Uh, other harm. Hobby. People are secretive about a hobby they have. Mm-hmm. Habit addiction. Um, those two are very, very neck and neck. Uh, I think they can maybe go together. We can let's just think of our addictions as hobbies. That's a better framing. Uh, legal things, I guess. Uh, abortion. Well, now, even with the ruling, you're going to even have more people probably be secretive about that. Preference. Preference for what? Anything. It could be, you know, one person confided in me, I don't like Radiohead. <laughs> uh, just either liking mm. something that people that you don't want people to know you like or disliking something that you don't want people to know you dislike. Gotcha. Romantic discontent, uh, hidden relationship, sexual orientation, physical discontent, mental health, social discontent, trauma, employment, belief, ideology, marriage proposal secret about a marriage so, so you're telling you to secret from like the parents or something that you made a marriage proposal to someone it, no, no, no a proposal that has yet to happen is is the prototypical oh. one here where you're oh, secretly gotcha. planning oh, God, a proposal. Gotcha. yeah yeah i thought you're keeping the you already did the proposal and you're keeping that secret uh pregnant poor work performance surprise being secret about being surprised about something is that it that yeah. you have a surprise planned for someone so oh I'm not very good at like guessing <laughs> what these mean. <laughs> Drug use, uh, and then the the least frequent is work discontent. Yeah, why would people be secret about work discontent? I think people love to bond with each other over how discontent they are about work. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay, so you found ninety seven percent of your participants say they currently have at least one of those secrets from this list I just read. So this covers this covers a large swath of humanity there. 
Yeah, that's really cool. Okay, so let's let's ping pong back to the 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 development and childhood aspect. You know how parents can foster a healthy relationship with their children um, that enables both privacy and a healthy level of trust and communication to avoid heightened secret keeping. Essentially, what you want to do when your child reveal something that upsets you or that you're disappointed by or that even makes you angry. And as hard as it can be in the moment, you do not want to respond with an angry outburst or, you know, severe disapproval, because if you respond in a really negative way, the teen will come away thinking, well, that didn't go well. I don't want to do that again. And so what you want to do is respond with compassion and acceptance. You can be disappointed, but you can still be there for them and say, I can help you with whatever it is. Thing, the compassionate response will keep the door open for, for future confessions, whereas an angry outburst is going to potentially close that door. You want them to feel okay coming to you with things that are hard to talk about and they're going to make themselves vulnerable to, to reveal these things. And that's really not the moment when you want to respond extremely negatively. The other thing to do is you mm. should also want to model effective coping skills yourself. And so if mm. your if your way of dealing with problems is really counter is really visibly counterproductive, if you know you have these, you know, outbursts of anger or or you know don't handle stress well, you know, kids can pick up on that. And if they rec if they see if you're modeling non-effective coping skills, they might develop those too. Um, and so there's some research that shows that when parents really are, you know, over controlling and don't have co good coping skills themselves, their children are more likely to become ruminators, you know, people rather than coming to someone with help, just thinking about it all on your own. This is great, great parenting advice in general. Yeah. You, you really don't hear that much, this kind of advice in some parenting books, you know, but uh, well, secrets, it's not a topic that is that prevalent in the psychological literature, right? I mean, you're you're the you're you're the guy, right? You're you're, you're the leader in this in this the study of this this topic. So, well, who else um, who else in the field is studying this topic? Folks, you know, in it, they're not really well. <laughs> um, some really <laughs> fascinating research um, from like a long time ago. Now, Dan Wagner did some research in in this space. Oh, um, yeah. James Pennebaker does research that's related. Um, he finds that when you sort of engage in expressive writing, you know, journaling can, can not necessarily does, can, can really help. Um, it's important to distinguish that from actual disclosure, actually talking to someone. Um, hmm. The more that journaling looks like actually talking to someone, the more it helps when you're getting someone, when you're trying to challenge your own counterproductive lines of thought. A lot easier for someone else to do, but if you're trying to do it alone, that's the goal, trying to find a new perspective that helps you moving forward. Is it true that some secrets are more frequently confided than others? Yes. In fact, the way the order of that list you were reading was ordered in that way. Um, so, mm. for example, work discontent is the secret we confide most in other people, as in it's common to be discontent at work. It's common to have that secret, but people also typically talk about that with other people. Oh, I gotcha. That that was literally how the, I read that. Hey everyone, I'd like to take a moment to talk about one of my favorite products that helps support my body and mind as I age. On the Psychology Podcast, we frequently talk about forms of wisdom and self-actualization that are often achieved in our 30s and 40s, or even older. But it can be frustrating to finally know what you want out of life, just as you start to lose the mental and physical energy to go get it. A culprit of decreasing energy, slower workout recovery, and general middle age symptoms that start showing up in our 30s is sentient cell accumulation. Sentient cells are sometimes called zombie cells because they're old, worn out cells no longer doing their job in our bodies, but they linger on in us after we want them gone, wasting our energy and nutrition. Qualio Senolytic is an amazing formula made by Neurohacker Collective, a company I really trust. I've known the folks at Neurohacker Collective for years now and they really are thoughtful about what they put into their products, always trying to be as science informed as possible. Qualio Senolytic combines 9 vegan, non-GMO, plant-derived ingredients that help your body eliminate sentient cells. Personally, it helps me operate with the wisdom of a 40-something with the mental and physical energy of a 20-something. The best part is you take Qualia Senolytic just two days a month. It's so easy and so helpful to the human aging process. 
To try Qualia Senolytic up to 50% off, backed by a 100-day money-back guarantee, go to neurohacker.com and use code PSYCHPODCAST15 for an additional 15% off. That's Qualia Senolytic for better aging and prime energy deep into life at neurohacker.com slash psychpodcast slash psych15. Okay, what is the intersectionality of morality and secret keeping? What do you do? You, do, you, do you like have a hard stance on that <laughs> or do you try to say agnostic? Uh, okay. I was about to answer in a very different way. Um, oh, okay. the, moral, okay. the, the morality of secret keeping is, is the bigger question. Let's, let's see if we end up there. The way morality seems to be most important to secrecy is the morality of the behavior that you're keeping secret. And the more that mm-hmm. someone believes their own secret to be immoral, the more they feel ashamed with that secret and the more they ruminate on that secret and the less capable they feel with coping with the secret um, and the more that secret hurts their well-being. So it's a really powerful dimension of secrets um, in terms of coping less well with them and, and being more hurt by them. And then also with respect to morality, when you're deciding who to talk to, which almost always you should talk to someone, not necessarily the person you're keeping the secret from. You want to choose someone who will see the morality of that issue in a similar way as you. If they're going to find Mm -hmm. what you tell them to be extremely morally wrong, um, that's not going to be so helpful to you in most cases. So you kind of want to find a like-minded individual or just someone removed from it all. Okay. And then uh, what about the other direction in which we could take this question? The morality of secret keeping. There are some, there's a class of secrets that most people agree is not immoral to keep. It's not wrong Mm. to keep these secrets and and people will call those white lies where, Mm. you know, you're just saying something to be nice. If the reason you're holding back a truth is just to be nice and polite and kind and, and not needlessly hurt someone's feelings, people will say that's generally the nicer thing to do rather than being brutally honest and, and hurting their feelings for, for no good reason. If you're keeping a secret from a partner, um, the more immoral you think this thing is, the more the other person would really find it to be a betrayal to have kept this thing a secret. And so, you know, when you're keeping something secret that could damage the relationship if you were to reveal the secret, that's when we get into some really hard questions as to what you should do, even if you think it's moral or immoral. most people, you know, there's this expectation of honesty and openness. And if the reason you're holding the secret back is you think it's good for the relationship, it's tough there. So the, the classic example is you've mm. cheated on your partner. Should you confess to it? And, mm. wow. you know, one thing that I think is an important issue when it comes to that question is, was this just a one-time thing? Dan Savage will say, um, that if it was a one-time thing, if the only reason you want to reveal this is to get this thing off your chest, well, you could be taking this heavy burden off you and just placing it right onto your partner. And so if this would just really upset them and it was a one-time thing, some folks will say, you know, maybe it's better for the relationship to withhold that. Um, If it's not a one-time thing, I think most folks would say that's a problem. Um, If it was a repeated offense, I think most people would say you do have to reveal that because there is a problem there that's not going to solve itself. The final thing to think about there is, would your partner want to know? And I asked a group of 300 people in committed relationships this question. Imagine that your partner is traveling for work and a total lapse of judgment. They get drunk. they, They cheat on you. This has never happened before. This will never happen again. Would you want to know? And 77% of the participants said yes. And that surprised me. I thought that I thought that number would be lower. Um, but the important point there is that some people would want to know and some people wouldn't. And so if this was a one-time thing and you're trying to decide what to do about it, I always suggest talk to a third party. This decision is so big. It's so consequential yeah. that there's there's no reason you have to decide it alone. That's a really good point. A lot of moral quandaries in in these kinds of situations. You know, what whether or not telling a secret does more harm than good, and um, you can you know utilitarians have a field day thinking about that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, uh, so, 
let's let's see you have like a really juicy concrete example can you tell me a little about uh dale coventry and uh, jamie kunz's uh secret the, the two public defenders yeah. yeah so these are two uh, illinois public defenders um one of them has since passed away um uh, recently but at the time they had uh, they had the secret and they had this secret for 26 years and the secret that they were keeping is that they knew their client who they were representing had committed a crime, murder, mm. and they knew that someone else was sitting in jail for this murder. Someone was wrongfully accused and imprisoned and was innocent. And so they knew that this person was sitting in prison innocent, and this was a secret they kept for 26 years. Um, and the mm. reason why they they weren't able, in, in their perspective, to reveal the secret is they learned it with attorney client privilege and their client refused did not give them permission to to reveal this information not until after his death and he did pass mm. away and they did finally come forward with the secret and this person was eventually released from prison but he was there for 26 years and when they described what it was like to have this secret you know they didn't say it was hard to hold back they didn't say it was hard to dodge questions what made the secret difficult was just that they had to live with it. They just had to think about this thing every every day or every time someone wrongfully accused was let free, of course they would be reminded of this huge secret that they were sitting on for decades. Yeah. It's it's just oh, I read that story. I was just like, man, I don't I don't want any secrets in my life. You know, <laughs> I'd rather wear my I do wear my heart on my sleeve and sometimes it's awkward. You know, like I don't know. I guess it's not a secret, but it's just like having no filter. I don't know. What is that? What is that about me? I have no filter. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I just don't like keeping uh, things inside that are um, that could be uh, lies in some way. But anyway, uh, well, what are some lessons we've learned um, from the trauma literature? That's really interesting to me as well. You know, like, um, and I really I love James James Pennebaker's work, and I love that you cited it in your book. Yeah, can you kind of talk about that connection a little bit? Yeah. So the relationship here is the ways in which we cope with trauma can be similar or can be helpful to understand the effective ways to do so when it comes to keeping with your own secret. Um, it doesn't have to be about trauma, but it can give you clues about what's the most healthy response here. And so, you know, James Pennebaker's early work showed that when people had traumatic experiences that they tended to not talk about with their friends, their health was worse for it. And so there, that earlier study was looking at people who recently lost their spouse and people who talked less about their grief or about the death of their spouse were unhealthier. They had more health problems. Um, and this is where this idea comes from that talking about traumatic experiences is potentially more helpful, often is more helpful than, than not. Um, and so this is where this research on expressive writing or journaling comes from. James Benebaker wanted to see if he gave people the chance to work through their trauma without the complication added by the other person potentially responding in a helpful or unhelpful way, you know, could they do better? And it turns out, yes, if what you use your journaling for is to find a way forward. If you're just sort of ruminating on the past in your journal, now it's just a written record of harmful rumination. But, you know, what you want to do if you feel really negative about something and if you feel like you're perseverating on it and you feel like a bad person for it, that's a signal to me that you need to change something. Um, and often that change of perspective is really easy to find when talking to another person. What another person can offer you that your journal can't is emotional support or is to call you out on something that is not healthy. Um, these are things that are a lot easier for other people to do. And this is why I suggest for most all situations, talk to someone about your secret. They can, they have so much to offer you when when you do, and it turns out the average experience of confiding a secret is one people say is helpful. Maybe it's because they're choosing the right people, but even if someone responds just in a lukewarm way, people will find that even helpful. So we don't need much when it comes to confiding secrets, and people have a lot to give. It's a really good message. Yeah, that's really really important. I am so excited to announce that registrations are now open for our self-actualization coaching intensive. 
While the coaching industry has taken great strides over the years toward integrating more evidence-based coaching approaches, there is still a lot of work to be done. Many coach training programs still lack strong foundations in science and do little to incorporate research-informed tools, methodologies, or approaches for helping clients thrive. For 20 years, I've dedicated my career to rigorously testing ways to unlock creativity, intelligence, and our potential as human beings. Now for the first time ever, I have compiled some of my greatest insights to bring the new science of self-actualization to the field of professional coaching. This immersive three-day learning experience will introduce you to self-actualization coaching, an approach intended to enhance your coaching practice by offering you evidence-based tools and insights from my research that will equip you to more effectively help your clients unlock their unique potential. Don't miss out on this unique opportunity. Join us and take your coaching practice to the next level. Go to sacoaching.org. That's sacoaching.org. I look forward to welcoming you in December. What are the three dimensions of secrets? So the, the three dimensions of secrets, you know, people often ask me, you have these 38 categories of secrets, which ones hurt more or, or which ones are more okay to keep? And, and the question, the reason why that question is too open-ended in that format is, well, 30 different kinds of secrets. To give you a good answer to that question, I'd have to tell you how each category of secret is different from each other category of secret. And that's just too many comparisons. And so a better way to understand how secrets differ from each other, or sort of what the themes are we use in thinking about secrets is to understand, could we sort them in a meaningful way? It turns out that we can, and to really well represent Ooh. how people naturally think about their secrets is to, we arrived at these three dimensions that come from not me, um, we, I'm not making these up, these came from the participant data um, themselves. Yeah. Factor analysis, factor analysis, yes. Right, factor analysis, but on, on um, data that was generated by participants, we didn't sort of give them the categories to begin with. I see. And I so one we've already talked about, morality, and this is the really big one. Um, the more immoral we believe our secrets to be, the more we feel ashamed of them. Um, another dimension people see their secrets as naturally varying along is how much those secrets involve other people and our relationships with them. And so some secrets are really highly relational, um, all the ones about relationships, all the ones about sex, uh, but other secrets don't involve other people. And these secrets feel much more personal and, and individual. Um, you know, a hobby is an example of that. Um, and it turns out the, the less the fewer people who are involved in our secrets, when our secrets only involve ourselves, we feel more isolated with those secrets. Mm. The third dimension is how goal-oriented the secrets are. And often that means in, in terms of our work life, but not always. And so secrets that are really high on goal orientation, uh, you know, include secrets around finances and secrets about work. And then secrets really low on this dimension seem to not be based in some obvious goal. Um, they seem to be based in more feeling, you know, things like sexual preferences and, and you know, things that are more emotional in nature, experiences of trauma, uh, things that are not directly linked to some goal that you're trying to achieve. And so the, the less our secrets are goal oriented, the less insight we feel we have into them and we're not really sure why we have them or, or what to do with them. And the reason why it's so useful to know that there's three dimensions of secrets, it suggests mm. that there's three ways in which a secret might hurt us. Um, we could feel ashamed of a secret, we could feel isolated with a secret, or we could feel uncertain and unsure what to do with the secret. But if there's three ways in which a secret can hurt you, it also means there's three ways in which a secret doesn't have to hurt you. And the good news is that in 95% of cases we see there's a dimension in which secret is not hurting you. And what we do in the research is help people figure out what that is because it starts pointing you to a helpful path forward. And so once you understand these dimensions, you can say, well, you know, am I, is one of these a, a path forward to me? So if you feel the secret is not wrong and, and immoral, even if you feel isolated with it, even if you feel unsure about it, it, people pointing out to people that there's nothing wrong about the secret, it helps them f move forward. This is really cool. This is this is a lot more levels of nuance about secrets than, than people are aware of. Mm. I'm glad we're having this conversation. <laughs> uh, so what are some tips to deflect direct questions in a conversation about a secret? So talking about secrets is helpful. 
but you need to be choosing the right person. And so if someone who it would not be the right person to discuss the secret with is asking you a question that you don't want to answer, what can you do? One of the most effective things you can do is ask a question of your own. Um, because the normal course of events is people ask answer questions that they were asked. And even though you haven't yet answered their question, if you ask a question, in most cases, they'll just answer. And in most cases, they won't even return to the original question because conversations move on. You can push it into another direction. And so instead of asking questions, you can also just introduce a new topic into the conversation. Hey, what are you doing this weekend? And just like, hey, let's talk about the weekend instead of what we're talking about now. And in most cases, people just will let the conversation move on. It's very rare someone will say, no, 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 what about that question I asked, you know, two conversational rounds ago? Mm -hmm. And so that will help you in almost all situations. What if someone instead really does press you on the question and you really don't want to answer it? You could say, I don't want to speak to that. You could say, you know, that's too private. Those aren't the best responses, though. A far better response is to say, you know, I appreciate your question or, you know, I, I, I'm glad that you are, are there for me and you know, asking this question and know that like, I value our relationship. I just don't want to get into that right now. Let's talk about that at some later point in time. It's so essentially thanking them for, for trying to look out for you. Uh, and just saying now's not the right moment. People feel much better about that than just saying, I don't want to talk about that. Yeah. We don't want to think our friends and our, and our significant others, are not comfortable enough to reveal something to us. And so that's not the impression you want to give typically. That makes a lot of sense. What is the purpose of creative projects and outlets for secret revealing? There are these ways, um, and Post Secret is a great example of this, for if you can't find the right person to reveal a secret to, one way forward is sort of just push that secret out into the world. And that can feel good for a little bit. You know, we see in our research when people reveal secret anonymously online. It can lift the burden of secrecy in that moment uh, when people look, you know, reveal a secret in some anonymous way, post secret, or um, we have this thing that you might be lucky enough to stumble in Central Park where you, you find the secret telephone where you could listen to other secrets yeah. and, and reveal your own. What is helpful about all these forms of revelation is, you know, sometimes the hardest part is just admitting to yourself this thing happened and it's real and it really happened and nothing will change that. And so for many people, the first step is kind of admitting to it out loud in some respect. But what's even more helpful than just, you know, releasing your secret into the ether is observing how another person responds to it. And that's why a conversation with another person is often much better. Um, But if you're not ready for that, you know, maybe the first step is, saying it out loud alone in a room you know maybe the next step is revealing it anonymously through post secret or or something like that um but i think what you want to work up to is is talking to someone about it i've never heard of post secret so that that was a new one for me oh yeah yeah Yeah. um yeah that's that's project that's been going on for a long time now and and it's still ongoing cool um well i I just want to end this interview on uh, maybe uh, the most positive note which is what is uh what are are there don't there exist positive secrets you know like when i tell uh like a surprise birthday party or like a promotion the person's gonna get so like that's yeah can you talk a little more about your any research you've done on positive secrets so positive secrets can be really fun and exciting and and for that reason they are very different from your prototypically negative secret um, a couple has been trying to get pregnant and then is pregnant. They'll often keep that a secret to find the right time to tell everyone, find the exciting time to tell everyone, um, any kind of surprise gift. Marriage proposals commonly uh, are kept secret too. And some of you know life's most joyous occasions start off as secrets. And why those secrets are so different is often the whole point of the secrecy is this big, exciting reveal. And when that's what the situation is, we feel very in control over the secret and we feel good about the secret because it's about something positive and we expect a positive outcome to to revealing it. And so we feel really in control over this. And so it's not just feeling positive, but feeling in control is really what's real so healthy about this situation. There's another kind of positive secret, though, that people don't necessarily have the intent to reveal. And that's what I call, you know, what do I call these? Oh, I call these secret joys. (laughs) Uh, And so Mm -hmm. 
you know, a, a lot of hobbies fit this category. You know, someone secretly collects coins or someone secretly likes cartoons or, you know, yeah. for some people, recreational drug use. And so if the reason yeah. you don't tell other people about this is that you just don't want to deal with them not understanding um, or maybe they might even disapprove. Um, another one example is, you know, meditation is another common one here. And so sometimes people think, I know I enjoy this. I know I'm doing it in the right way. That's not harmful to me. Um, rather than deal with people not getting it or rather than deal with people's disapproval, I'm just going to keep this to myself. And that kind of situation for me, it shows that there's other kinds of solitude than sort of this negative social isolation we kind of think of. When it's mm -hmm. something you feel good about and you feel sure about it, you can feel a sense of independence and autonomy that comes from keeping the secret. Like, I, th I think when it's like, well, if positive secrets feel so different, if we feel so in control over them and feel like we're doing the right thing for the right reasons and we feel sure of ourselves, I think the question is, how can we feel that way about our other secrets? What what could get us there? Yeah. Wow, I've I've thought more about secrets in the past hour than I have my whole life, and <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna so much I learned from you today, and I'm sure our listeners did as well. Um, thank you so much for the work you've done over the yeah. over more than ten years of your career, and um, and thanks for being on my podcast today. Thanks for having really me. Really appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.